Plants have the capacity to tell us fascinating stories about the landscapes they live in if we can just learn how to read them. The different species that make up plant communities are like plots and subplots weaving together to construct a story that can tell the person who is able to read them about the wildlife that lives there and the soil and rocks beneath their feet. They can also provide clues about how the land is changing, for example in response to cattle grazing, and tell you what the land will look like in the future if current trends continue. They can also provide us with clues about the history of the land, revealing long-lost landscapes and ways of life. Such plants are known as indicator species and can provide vital clues to conservationists who want to predict and avoid detrimental changes to the land or who want to find out what man-made landscapes would have originally looked like so they can be restored to their natural habitats. An indicator is like a clue. It points you in the direction of something but is not the thing itself. One plant clue might lead you to the wrong conclusion about how a landscape might have changed, but with enough of them you can begin to piece together pretty accurately what a landscape might have once looked like. I've come to a remote agricultural landscape in northeast Scotland to play plant detective using a series of indicator species. The only forests you can see on these hills are conifer plantations, and the valleys have been filled with grain crops and cattle for as long as anyone living can remember. But what did this landscape look like hundreds of years ago? With the help of a few indicator species, I hope to try and piece together what this landscape might once have looked like all those years ago. My first clue is a solitary plant that has survived from long ago. Walking down this farm trap, there's little evidence of the plants that would have once have grown here. There's never been a great tradition of leaving hedgerows in this part of the world, and most of the plants by this roadside have been mown and sprayed multiple times. But one single plant seems to have escaped this onslaught, and is clinging onto the side of this slope. It's Heather, Luna Vulgaris, and it's in bloom right now. Might this landscape once have been covered in purple? If so, then it suggests that the soils would once have been very different too, as Heather only really thrives on well-drained, acidic soils. But what else would have lived alongside the Heather in this kind of habitat? Well, if we have a look at some of the plants that are springing up from the bank of seeds in this hedgerow, then we can get an idea about some of the other plants that might have lived alongside it. Now have a look at this little prickly specimen over here. Gorse, Ulex europea in Latin. Unmistakable when it blooms in summer with its bright, bright yellow pea-like blossoms which have this unmistakable coconut smell. And here we have broom, Cytus scoparius, clinging on between the Sitka spruce that were planted here. So what do all these clues point towards? Well, I built up a picture in my head of an open landscape dominated by heather with quite large patches of gorse, a bit of broom, and other heathland species in between on pretty well-drained, acidic soils. With a basic knowledge of heathland ecology, I would expect that the kinds of trees that would colonise a site like this would initially be birch and rowan, maybe succeeded by Scots pine in the absence of grazing or burning. But just how accurate is this picture that I've built up using these indicator species? Well, it just so happens that a small fragment of the original habitat survived until the 1980s, till just behind me, till it was bought by Jimmy Ray, who lives in the house just next to me, and ploughed up for agriculture. I'm going to talk to a farming couple who worked the land around this hill until they recently retired, Sandy and Edith Crookshank, and see if they can corroborate the story that I think I may have uncovered. It would be lovely. Thank you very much. Excellent. Do you take milk in your tea? I do. Correct. Yes. 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 Just down the road from yes. here. So you've been working actually here since 1965. Yes. Fantastic. So what kind of farmer would you consider yourself? A livestock farmer, an arable farmer, or a bit of both? I'm a bit of both. Livestock and, 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 and arable. Oh, right. 
And so what kind of livestock did you feed? Really, at, really at the cattle for the beef market. Okay, fantastic. What sort of size of herd did you have? How many cattle did you have? Only in the little bit. Sixty. Sixty minutes. Cool. Sixty. Okay. Brilliant. So, how would you feel about um, maybe going for a walk up the fields and having a look for ourselves? Feel a look for ourselves. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Self-dreaming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.